So now that we've seen the two big setup pieces for dealing with a statistical test, that is identifying our hypotheses and then our level of significance, with those in mind, we can then actually get into the process of performing the test itself. You know, this is stuff all I've seen so far is, like I said, the setup. And going from here, what we need to do is actually get the information we're going to use to perform our test. That is, we need to collect our sample, sample of whatever it may be. In those earlier examples, it may have just been people we were asking, or maybe you take measurements of things. Whatever the sample is going to be, that's what you would do next in terms of our problems for homework, that sort of thing. It's going to be given information, but imagine you did all that work, or imagine someone did all that work anyway. And then from there, we draw our statistics for comparison, which we call our test statistic in particular. And I'll say that I have trouble with that statistic, that stuff just runs into each other. I sometimes say test statistic, just I don't know what that is, but bear in mind it'll happen. Anyway, when we're running our test, as it were, we need the statistic that we can compare the parameter that is supposed to be working, that's supposed to be as we expect, to the reality of our sample. If we're looking at a parameter mean mu, then we will draw something like x bar to compare it to. If we're looking at a proportion, as we'll see in 7.4, We'll have the value p that we'll compare to the value p hat. If you do some of the extra work, you'll see things you can do with comparing sigma, the population standard deviation, to s, a sample one. And then similarly, we'll get into chapter 8, how you can do things with comparisons between different parameters using samples. And then in chapter 9, we'll look at a thing called the correlation coefficient in terms of the sample correlation coefficient, which has the letter R, but that's not for a while yet. Anyway, these are the main pieces that we're looking at, where when we're making that comparison, we make it in terms of a somewhat idealized distribution built around that parameter that we have. You can standardize it if you want to, and that's what we'll do a lot in 7.2 and 7.3, at least in the book is we'll standardize back to the standard normal or a t distribution, but you can also work with it in terms of the specific value you have, something like a mean of 50 miles to the gallon, and what we do is we essentially see how likely it is that assuming that value is true, it's usually our baseline assumption when we're talking about a statistical test, a hypothesis test that is, we're going to assume that, see how likely it is that that is the case, with the context of having gotten the value we get from our sample. So if we have that value 50, we can use the information we have to see how likely unlikely it is that our sample came up with a value of 51 or 55 or 80 or whatever you have. And that's what we make our decision on in terms of our level of significance, which is something we'll see in more detail as we actually get to doing these tests. But for now, we're just going to get the setup for what they look like where when we're making that sort of determination, we can do it in terms of either critical or p-values, which are kind of the same thing, just in two different contexts, in two different frames of reference. I'll say I personally prefer the p-value method, for reasons I'll explain. The book prefers the critical value method, for reasons I'll also explain, but either really does basically the same thing. For the critical value method, what you do is you take your level of significance alpha, and you essentially make yourself a region in the distribution that corresponds to that value alpha. What exactly it looks like, I'll talk about when we get to this part. But you make that region, and if the value you got from the sample falls into that region, then you consider that evidence to say that something was wrong with your assumption. It is appropriately unlikely that it's not just random chance. And as a result, you would reject the assumed truth of the parameter value, that is, you would reject the null hypothesis. Similarly, if you want to deal with p-values, what you do is instead of focusing on the region defined by the level of significance, you make a region based on the test statistic, where what you do is you take that test statistic and you find the likelihood of getting anything more unusual than that. So say you get a value of 52 with that comparison to 50, and that has a 20% chance of happening, that would be your p-value, as you have a 20% chance of getting that 52 or more, comparatively. 
I think this is a little bit more efficient. I think it's a bit more direct. I think it has a bit more of an understanding of what we're trying to do here. I think it's easier to see how that works, which is why I prefer it. It's also what the calculator does. So mechanically, it's better for me. The book assumes a lot of work with tables is what you're going to do. And they're, they're, they're a bit uh, troglodytic in that way. So they prefer critical values because tables work better for critical values. Either way, it's just a matter of how you want to set up that frame of reference for defining the area that says something is suitably unlikely. If you get a p-value that's smaller than your level of significance, that says it's not just chance. You know, if you get a 0.0002% chance of having what you expected, then odds are something's wrong. But, like I said before, it's always a matter of interpretation. Statistics is, after all, to tie it back to things I talked about at the very beginning of this class, an interpretive science, and that's a vital step with that interpretation. And as far as what that interpretation looks like, that's where we get these ideas of left, right, and two-tailed tests, where we call a test left-tailed if we're looking for potentially things smaller. We're looking in the left side of the distribution. I'm getting my directions backwards, and it's left of the board. <laughs> right-tailed if we're looking for bigger things, things to the right, and two-tailed if we can take either. But essentially, these tails represent the regions of unlikelihood, the regions of things that are so far beyond the pale that we're willing to accept something is wrong with our assumptions if we get in there. But it's, again, all down to how badly you want that result. Anyway, this is more set up. Next, we're going to continue on with this train and talk about what we actually mean. I mentioned it a little bit in terms of making those decisions to reject, not reject a few times by now, but we'll see that a little bit more next. And then finally get to defining our steps before moving on into our next few sections of this chapter to properly perform a test. There's a lot of setup. We still haven't gotten to that yet, but trust me, this stuff's worth getting good at.